Hey guys, today I wanted to walk through a test I recently did in regard to seating depth. To preface things, a lot of times you will see individuals choosing a seating depth based on low sample size testing. And the thought process behind it is, is that there is a vibrational node or timing that comes with seating a projectile at a certain depth. From there, a seating depth test is conducted where if you start jumping in six thou increments, or in other words, seating the bullet deeper by six thousandths, you will see your group start to tighten in and at some point, and moreover, while conducting the seating depth test, it is usually taught that if the first two aren't touching, then you go ahead and skip the next seating depth that was next to test, and then shoot the next six thou deeper to see if the bullets touch. If they do, you continue to shoot. However, there is a lot of questions I have with this as it does not align with the topic of true dispersion of groups as seating depth tests usually aren't retested in great length after picking a predetermined depth or even a bad depth with large sample sizes and can commonly get confused with being statistically significant. What I mean by that is, is even if a group appears to be bad with two shots, doesn't mean that that group can't close up by firing more rounds at that specific seating depth at multiple targets. The same can be had with shooting a very good group. That group, if retested multiple times, can open up just as easily and turn into a bad group, then back to a good group, and vice versa. This is true dispersion. So, if we are conducting a seating depth test merely based on low sample size testing, as in shooting a few rounds per seating depth, and one group appears to look the best, this does not mean that we'll always produce the same group size. Same thing with a supposed bad seating depth it can just as easily turn into a good group with higher sample size testing. Further, let's take this target as an example and say this is a seating depth test. You can see groups get really tight at some points and open up, just like when doing an actual seating depth test. If we are following the seating depth or timing methodology, we would pick the two smallest groups with the best SD. However, as soon as we remove the title seating depth, this is what your target will look like when shooting the same seating depth that we have believed to be the best to verify when you truly test for real dispersion. You can see that it looks identical to that of the seating depth test. Ultimately, this is why I wanted to test the timing and seating depth method from previously observed results. Moreover, to see if the ideology would truly hold up under real world testing and by shooting large sample sizes like 200 rounds similar to a match setting. Now, to keep this in mind, the rifle recoils first, then the projectile exits second. Consider a bench rest gun that weighs 30 pounds, that shoots a super low recoiling round. This, inherently, is going to be a more precise shooting rifle in most shooters' hands than a rifle that weighs 4 pounds and shoots a super heavy recoiling round. This is because the rifle recoils first and then the projectile exits second. To put in perspective how good of shooters you all are, you have to keep less than 16 thousandths of angular dispersion at the muzzle just to keep a 1 MOA group. So having all of that said and being lucky enough to be mentored and shown some neat things on the internal ballistic side on what leads to the precision of a rifle system for work, I wanted to see what it would be like with the shooter behind the rifle as well and test a hybrid style projectile and do a modified test of what Brian Litz has done. Furthermore, if isolating a shooter from this test completely and using a bench rest railgun, the groups can be wide or super small as well, consistently. We can see this in bench rest railgun competition results with the shooter removed. However, that is due to entirely different factors other than what is believed to be a vibrational node that will be discussed in a few months, maybe a year that we will get to show you, hopefully on the component side of internal ballistics, than if a shooter was on the rifle as well. To elaborate, there are multiple things that can affect the precision of a rifle system. While some things can be controlled, some cannot be fixed on the reloading bench, but rather at the manufacturer and lead us to believe that seeing a result physically is caused by a single variable change on the reloading bench. For example, like just changing seating depth to try to squeeze in our groups. But the reason we believe that the result of the group closing in we just yielded can be due to something entirely different than a seating depth change, similar to type 1 and type 2 errors in statistics. Moral of the story, just because we have changed one thing and yield a certain result, doesn't mean that the thing we change actually caused the end result. Having that said, let's talk about recoil management and being consistent. You can have two types of shooters. 
Shooter A, who is bad at recoil management, but can consistently produce a bad group size with hand loads. After all, bad group size is completely subjective based on shooting application. When shooting a large enough sample size, it still shows what is truly going on by shooting enough groups to be statistically significant. Then we have shooter B who uses the same hand loads as shooter A, but is very good at recoil management and conducts the same test. While shooter B is better at recoil management and can consistently produce tighter groups, the conclusion for both shooters A and B will have the same outcome because both were shooting statistically large enough sample sizes and the results can still be measured. To elaborate, let's say before we change anything for the two shooters hand loads, we have both of them shoot multiple groups to establish a baseline group size for the test. Shooter A, who is bad at recoil management, is consistently grouping one MOA on average when shooting 63 shot groups. Shooter B, who is better at recoil management, is constantly grouping one half MOA on average when shooting 63 shot groups as well. Then we change one variable on the bench with our hand loads to see if we can statistically observe a change and shooter A goes from a baseline control of one MOA on average to let's say three fourths MOA. And shooter B, who is better at recoil management, goes from half MOA on average to one fourth MOA. Both shooters are still yielding the same results from the test because they both yielded a one fourth MOA change from the baseline after changing one variable. But can we factually say that one variable that we changed truly caused the outcome for the test? Not necessarily. For example, if we change seating depth, is it truly the timing that is squeezing in our groups? Or is it actually something entirely different that yielded those results that one may not understand? This is type 1 and type 2 errors in statistics. For an example, you go to the doctor to get tested for an illness. There's two errors that could occur. Type 1 error could be a false positive, meaning that the test results say you have the illness, but you actually don't. A type 2 error, which in our example would be a false negative, meaning that the test results say we don't have the illness, but we actually do. All in all, things can be very misleading. Now, let's finally get down to the results. I have failed to prove that seating depth matters with the hybrid style projectiles. So let's talk about how this test was conducted. The first thing I did was load up rounds in 6,000 seating depths increments for four different groups. What I mean by that is I loaded up rounds with 6,000s, 12,000s, 18,000s, and 24,000 seating depths from the seating depth I usually shoot. Before we began, I separated all four seating depths behind my shooting position into four different sections and had someone pick randomly from each pile three rounds specifically of one seating depth and give them too many to shoot so I did not know what seating depth I was firing to eliminate any bias. This also allowed me to shoot all four seating depths round robin style in a different order to account for carbon buildup and barrel heat. While I was shooting, I did not want to break position either, so I had her hand me the rounds. Every single round was recorded and ended up being 190 rounds with an 8.4 SD total out of the 190 rounds in a row recorded. With a Magneto, I just learned this the other day. Unfortunately, after shooting 200 rounds and not realizing this, once you get to 99 shots, you have to reset it so it continues to record. Otherwise, it will override your 99th shot with the next follow-up round shot down range. Like again, I had to reconduct this test twice to get accurate data, which really sucked. But regardless, this is a load that I have tested throughout the barrel's life. And on any given day, I can confidently say it maintains a 6 to 8 SD with 90 rounds, but I have never shot this load with 190 rounds in a row recorded, so I was pretty happy. The reason I did not shoot a full 200 rounds was that I completely cleaned the barrel of all carbon fouling and used the first 10 to get the barrel back to a good condition. The first 10 rounds seemed to be always erratic in regard to velocity and need some fouling to get things settled in. Now, let's get to look at the data. For those who do not know, a regression in statistics works in a way that allows you to look at all the ways that could possibly influence an outcome. Then it determines the magnitude and significance of each. In other words, regression analysis is a set of statistical methods used for the estimation of relationships between a dependent variable and one or more independent variables. 
It can be utilized to assess the strength of the relationship between variables. So when you do a regression of average velocity versus group size from my data, the p-value is 0.06, which could easily be argued to be significant just on a 94% level instead of a 95%. Then just the seeding depth p-value is 0.33. So I'd say that's pretty insignificant. From a visual perspective, you would expect to see more separation in the boxes that you can see here if seeding depth was making a significant difference in group size in this scenario. If you regress both against group size at the same time, seeding depth goes to 0.87 and velocity to 0.12. This means my velocity is much more significant for group size than seeding depth was. When we look back at the velocity regression and seeding depth chart, we can see again that velocity had more of a statistical significance than seeding depth did in group size. However, we can see that even velocity itself is not super close to the trend line clustered. So something else is going on, which is where type one and type two errors in statistics come into play with other variables. I say this because even though velocity is not the most consistent, we can see that seeding depth itself is less statistically relevant than velocity for group size, which makes this even more important and apparent. Taking that information and looking back at the test results again, it has shown that even with velocities maintaining a single digit SD with 190 rounds recorded, at different seating depths totaling 24,000s difference, the seating depth was not statistically significant to the result of our group sizes. Shooting this rifle mainly on target for the entirety of its barrel life, with the exception of when the barrel was in its infancy stages, remained very consistent in group sizes, even with velocities changing from 2860 to 2820 feet per second because of environmental and barrel wear conditions. In regard to timing, this shouldn't be happening according to the ideology with changes to velocities. Otherwise, the velocity variations would be changing the bullet exit time and result in statistically worse groups. It could be argued that since the velocities were so consistent over the entirety of this test that it contributed to the barrel timing. However, this isn't the case. Take, for example, two cars. Car one is going 100 miles per hour and car two is also going 100 miles per hour. If car one has a 20 foot lead on car two, that means car one will hit the finish line before car two. The same applies to seating depth. By changing the seating depths according to the timing theory, you will be altering the barrel lead time each time you alter seating depth. And from six thousandths to 24 thousandths, they would all be exiting at different times, even with consistent speeds. To wrap this up, I encourage anyone who has different findings than I do to please send your chronograph and group data in. If you would like to try this for yourself, please make sure to shoot us an email so I can send you the testing requirements to make sure everything is equal and little things aren't missed that will change the outcome of the test. I would really like to add it to what I have to see if we can dig a little bit deeper into this. If you'd like my own data, go to reloadingallday.com and shoot us an email or drop a comment below. I'm more than happy to send it out to you guys. Let me know what you think in the comments below and thanks for watching.